Hello, I'm Alistair MacLeod and I'm in Madrid on behalf of the Gold Money Foundation and with me I have Pedro Schwartz who is Professor of Economics at San Pablo University in Madrid. Welcome and it's very, very nice to meet you. Very glad to be here. Um, you've been around a long time and you have seen... Well, How did you discover well, that? <laughs> <laughs> Must be the colour of no, my hair. <laughs> I, well, yes, we, we will suffer from that a little bit. but. Um, you have seen an awful lot of change in Spain over the years and the, the most recent problems that Spain faces are really quite enormous. What's your take on it? Is there a way out of this or you know, does your experience f sort of indicate that there is a path away from this trouble? Indeed, it's not the first time in my life that I've seen Spain in trouble and Spain stand up again and go ahead. The longest crisis was just when Franco died. Uh, it was at the time of the oil crisis, so the two coincided. And there was a long recession from 74 till 84, 10 years. And there was and, huge political uncertainty at the time, And wasn't there was huge there? political uncertainty and inflation reached, if I remember rightly, I was at the Bank of Spain then, reached 27% annum, per annum, and we had to change uh, the whole industrial setup, which uh, which was based on using lots of energy, and we got out of that and entered the European Union, um, as it's now called. So I think Spain is in a much better, on a much better ground now than it was then. And if we do the right thing, the new government coming now in November does the right thing, uh, then I think the economy and so and the society can can function again much better than it has in the last two or three years. How confident are you that the government will do the right thing? Well, um, it's the Bible that says don't put your faith in princes, but in the only God. <laughs> and so, no faith in princes. But I do hope that, that circumstances will make them do the right thing, just as our present socialist government that was doing very much the wrong thing for, for six years, suddenly found itself in such a situation that they changed direction totally and started to do the right thing, that is, started to be more responsible than it used to be. I have great faith in circumstances, much more than in men. I think I agree with you on that one. And um, in analysing what the ECB's role is in all this, I felt that they have little option but to stand back and let governments deal with their own problems and maybe just deal with the banks, which themselves are a knock-on and a major problem for the ECB to deal with. Um, but there, that, the ECB is now under enormous pressure to start printing money, to buy government debt, to rescue the, you know, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, whoever, from their problems, which would take the pressure off the governments and not force them to take the actions which perhaps they should. Do you think that's... I think you've described things as they are, in fact, the rules of the ECB forbid them either uh, to the letter or by implication forbid them to carry out, uh, to play the role that they're playing now in buying a government debt in the secondary market because they can't buy it in the first when, when it's being issued and other, other, other things that they do are the cheat, cheating that they do. Um, the ECB is not the institution that will right the fortunes of Europe. It cannot do so unless we think that a huge inflation might help, and I don't think it would. So what they've tried to do in the last meetings of the European Union is to start a parallel institution, the fund, the stability fund, the European stability, Financial and Stability Fund. And that one would take over from the ECB, the role of the ECB is playing now, and be the ones that save governments and give them uh, finance when they're attacked, as but, people say, by uh, speculators. But how is it to be funded? Well, they're doing it the wrong way, in my, in my opinion, because they're putting some money there, but they are in fact leveraging. That is, they're asking the markets to uh, give them uh, some funds on the basis of the funds they have. And I thought that leveraging was the wrong thing to do. I think that's what uh, the credit crunch was uh, about and how we absolutely. are meant to escape from this so sort of behaviour. <laughs> so here we are, governments learning the wrong lesson. Mm. So 
I, I think that one thing that should be contemplated is <clears throat> allowing countries that are in trouble and that have to go broke, um, leave the euro for some time and come back if they, if they do the right thing. I think the idea, uh, things should be organized so that Greece could leave the euro for a time. And it can be done, but um, people don't seem to know how to do it. I think it could be done. Well, th th it's an interesting point because um, so many commentators say, well, if Greece left the euro, it would deal with the problem because they, they'd rather, I think, they want Greece out of, out of the way, in effect. Um, but it seems to me there are two ways in which this can be done. One is that Greece leaves the euro in the formal sense but retains the euro as the currency. And the other, which I think quite a lot of people are referring to, is that Greece adopts its own currency again, the drachma or whatever they call it, um, and uses that. Now, the problem I see with the latter course is that um, as soon as you get a new drachma, it is going to collapse because nobody will have any faith in it. Um, whereas if they retain the euro, then at least the private sector has got a certain medium of exchange. I mean, what's your take on, on this my, problem? My take is that there should be parallel currencies. That you, in, in Greece, now you would allow the government to issue drachmas and allow the people who reside in Greece pay their taxes in drachmas and do their operations in that if they wish or if not they can uh, they can uh, write their contracts in euros so I think the idea would be to have two currencies we have um, a lot of experience of that in Latin America where the dollar and the local peso go together and and I think that in that way you would have the, the government, instead of saying uh, we are going to reduce the value of your debt by 50%, you would allow the, the, the markets to decide with a devaluation of the drachma how much the, the, debt of, um, the debt of Greece is worth. But the debt at the moment is in euros. I mean, are you, is there going to be some mechanism to transfer the debt over? Well, in fact, they've taken a measure to avoid any gains. And now the debt has been transferred, I read in the papers the day before yesterday, to London, uh, located there, so that that cannot be devalued except, as they've done it, by 50%, because they've agreed that that's what the, the haircut they want, to, uh, they want for that currency. I don't know how they're going to do it, but some people will have to lose with the, European, the Greek debt. I mean, if it's not worth what they say it isn't, it is, well, then it isn't. Then it isn't, exactly. Right, and so uh, what, it was a bad investment. It wasn't as a huge investment because it's not a very large sum compared with, with the rest of the European Union. And if, they, if it's not worth what, what the paper says, then it has to be worth less. So yes, I think debt holders, holders of Greek debt, should take a loss. Yes, and uh, but coming back from that a little bit, um, the primary problem, it seems to me, um, in terms of financing the existing stock of debt, let alone new debt, is that you don't have a central bank effectively printing money to buy the debt. Um, and this, I think, is the big difference, say, between the United States, the UK, and the members of Euroland, if you mm. like. Um, and under the circumstances where you can't print money to buy your own debt, that is where the weakness appears because there are just not enough savings to go around with all governments borrowing at the same time. And it's a clash which I find quite hard to resolve in my own mind without um, resorting to money printing. Well, the other, the other solution that they're putting forward is cutting on, expense, on, on expenditure. So you it, have to reduce expenditure. Ab I, I absolutely agree. But um, you know, you've got Italy in the position where they've got to roll over an enormous amount of debt. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, their budget deficit is not too bad, as it were. Um, sort of more or less in balance, but could go wrong, if you like, if um, the economy goes into recession. Um, but how do you roll over that huge amount of debt when the banks naturally want to contract their balance sheets? Because they're now risk averse rather than embracing risk. Well, I think that the markets would be much happier if, if Italy said, I want to roll over past debt, but I'm not asking for any new debt because I have a surplus on my budget. Now, if they had, they not only rolled over 
the old debt by asking some money from markets, but also because they re-plug into the debt their profits, so to say, so to speak. So that would really allow the market to say, all right, we're going to lend money to Italy because they have a surplus and they are slowly writing down the debt uh, and they are not asking for any more. So I think there would be money for Italian debt if Italy not only didn't ask for more, but also was using some of the surplus on the, on the deficit, on the budget, to uh, write off the debt. Absolutely. So that the markets would see that there is a programme of debt reduction overall right. rather than just... Right. Now, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, coming back to Spain, uh, is Spain a long way from that, do you think? Well, Spain is in a peculiar position because our debt is not such a, a big amount. We are, must be 62% of GDP, so re relatively the amount of debt we, we, we have were issued is lower than British, lower than American, lower than France and lower than Italy. So it's not so much the public sector that's in trouble as private, private banks sector. and families. Yes, exactly. They have, they have uh, overextended, they have uh, overdemanded uh, funds from, from outside. Now, there's a rule in political economy which is private debt, when it's too big, becomes public debt because the government has to come to the rescue of banks. We've certainly seen that in America. We have indeed. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it in Britain too. So, in the end, it, the private sector is, is hugely indebted in Spain and also some of that debt is not promising any... Uh, some, some of the investments that the banks have made is not promising any returns because they are in, uh, they're in real estate and that sector is and not that's, doing well. Exactly, and that sector, as I understand it, is um, it's, it's not being allowed to evolve away from its problems. It's almost in aspect because of the problems that would knock on to the banking system. Indeed, well, the, you have two parts of the banking system in Spain. You have the savings banks and the normal banks. <clears throat> the, the, the ordinary banks have become, begun to set aside their real estate. Banco Bilbao Vizcaya said three, four days ago that they were creating a special division for real estate, the same with Banco Santander and others. So, uh, but it's very big, it's very big, and it'll take them time to write that off. And, uh, and if prices go on falling, because they're beginning to unload all that on the market, then the problem grows. So they really, uh, Spanish banks and savings banks, really have a problem. Yes, and indeed. They don't know how to, how to face it, really. That's one thing. The other thing is, everything would be better if we grew. So it's growth, both for Greece, and for Greece, for Italy, for France, for Spain. It's growth that really is the, the question. And so we shouldn't be asking, what is the, how can we do away with our debt and how can we manage that? Is how can we grow? And if, if, we want, if we want to grow in Spain, you have to change the framework. We have to change labor laws. You have to change lots of things that we have here, which impede companies and people from forging ahead. That's a very interesting answer because the Keynesian idea of growth is just chuck money at the problem. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. No. And they're, <laughs> and they're trying to get uh, Germany to chuck money at the rest of Europe. That's extraordinary. They say, you yeah. Germans are too productive. Will yeah, you exactly. please consume? <laughs> no, no yes. thank you. Yes. We note that you have the best economy in Europe, but that's not the point. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Will you spoil it, please? Exactly. <laughs> so, yes, I mean... I, I agree with you, and I think um, it makes an awful lot of sense. It is framework, and in the general sense, there has to be a planned, um, if you like, reduction of government interference in the way the economy works. Mm. In, in, in pure political terms, um, it seems to me that this is such a different direction from that which European countries have been used to going, that you know, they socialise everything, effectively. Um, how difficult is it going to be for the political and the bureaucratic mindset to embrace an idea that interventionism is yesterday's story and it doesn't work and the future has got to be less intervention. Very difficult, uh, especially I think because Germany is going that way too. Uh, it's always presented as a model for all of us and what they've done during the 10 years before this crisis was uh, to have 
agreements between the representatives of trade unions, of companies and the government saying let's cut this and do away with that. Now that's not really the market. It's a political agreement. They've done the right thing and the economy is going well. But the method they've used is one that will also will push us further down the way of statism rather than towards the way of markets. So even from that point of view, it's a bit depressing. But in any case, what you, what you certainly need is a change in the framework, and that is a matter for governments rather than social contracts or general agreements. And governments will have a very tough time. The mindset of Europeans is not that way, it doesn't go that way. <clears throat> and if on top of that you put at the head of governments a bureaucrat, somebody coming from Brussels, uh, because they are doing what Brussels says, I don't know how long uh, public opinion will back them. There's always the problem that to follow the, the mandate that's required is, is a reversal thing. So it means reversing a lot of legislation as well. Mm. And um, that I think is politically difficult, but within the European framework it's perhaps even more difficult when so much of the legislation that is restrictive has emanated from Brussels. Oh yes, I, I recently was in the UK and there they were speaking to me about working hours. There's a maximum of working hours and they were saying, well some doctors are working more than the hours they should because they say that it's not working, they are at the other end of a telephone, they can be called in but they are really in bed. So, uh, and, and so these, these sorts of interferences or rules coming from Brussels, sometimes they are well meant but sometimes make life much more difficult for, for countries that have to grow. One of, I, one of the things I feel is that it's um, impossible for uh, a reconstructed economy to work without savings. And I think the lesson of Germany's success has been that's a savings-driven economy mm. as opposed to a consumption-driven economy which rarely describes most of the rest of Europe. Um, uh, do you think that savings are central to um, any, um, if you like, long-lasting economic recovery? Um, and I think this is a, a very important question because the more you print money, the more you destroy savings because you're transferring capital from savings as capital destruction. What, do you think that um, they might place an emphasis on savings in, in, in Spain, the new government? Well, it's, uh, well the, people are beginning to say this. Uh, and the connection is savings and investment. Exactly. Investment is there because you get the future consumption. You hope to make a profit, but it's savings and investment. People don't seem to understand that investment is consumption. You uh, use uh, uh, resources. Uh, so often one reads comment that, that you know, you've got the savings paradox and all this sort of rubbish. It's an old story that comes from 1936 and, the, yes. and a man called Lord Keynes. Um, well, savings is investment, is, is consumption. You it consume is. hours of workers and you consume resources and whatnot. So uh, it, there's no um, opposition between savings and consumption. It's only that consumption can, must come further down the line and that you should look for savings and the right atmosphere for savings, no, for, for investment. And that needs savings. That needs indeed. savings. Yeah. And it needs savings not only in the way we're thinking now, but also for our retirement and for to take the place of some of the state activity in pensions and other things like that. And that uh, change in mentality has to come. People will have to save more from much earlier to be sure that they have a comfortable retirement. Indeed. So really, I think what we can tell the new government is that they must encourage savings. Because without that, then you know, the changing the law about um, employment hours or whatever, whatever, isn't actually going to count for very much. It's savings that is probably the most well, important. Well, the changing, thing. the changing the, uh, uh, not the law of retirement, but the changing of, of of the labour laws are also very important. It's obvious that the Spanish labour market doesn't work, because when at the end of the day, if you go to um, one of those local markets, you see all the fish on the slabs there with ice on it at the end of the day, nobody's bought it, price must be wrong. Yes. And so our labour market is not working. We have a number of people who are ensconced in their old jobs and in fact their real wages have gone up during the crisis in Spain. And then you have uh, 
half the youth not working or working in, in different hidden ways or perhaps in, daily, in, in weekly, weekly jobs and so on. And that is not only morally unjustified, but it also hurts the future growth of Spain, but also there must be something that is stopping the young from finding jobs. And also that's promoting the idea that you don't really need a job and uh, what's good in life to have a lovely time and we have rights, rights, we want rights, uh, don't know who pays for them and so on. So there's a social mentality that comes with unemployment and that can be quite, well, is a tragedy in Spain. It's, it is a tragedy, and particularly with uh, such a high level of youth unemployment as well. As I understand it, there's, it's really the highest in Europe, just about. It is the highest, and it must be 46% of uh, young people from uh, 16 to 25 are unemployed or officially unemployed. And that is very bad, because when you have a job that lasts for a week or for two months, then you're not trained. You, you, don't, you don't go up the, the ladder in the company. Uh, and then there's another thing, which is the difficulty of creating a new, a new company. Um, there's a lot of red tape that stops you from doing that, and so on. We could go on saying it's the framework of the laws, of economic laws, that has to be changed, and to do that, you have to be a very courageous government. Uh, trade unions in Spain are financed by the government, and by the European Union, but not by the dues of their members. Now that should be that should change because if they are financed by the government and not by members, then they look out, they don't look after the members. They look perhaps after their small number of members, but they certainly don't look after the unemployed. Petro, broadening, broadening it out a bit, um, we're all on a dollar standard, and um, so what goes on in America and the Fed is of fundamental importance to all of us, and we can't operate in a in a vacuum. Um, What's your view of the quantitative easing that the Fed has engaged in? And um, I know that they don't have QE3, but they do seem to have an open checkbook, if you like, for anyone who needs any money. Um, it seems that nobody is too big to fail. Uh, nobody's too small to fail, perhaps. <laughs> um, what's your take on this, and, and where is it going to take us eventually? What does it lead to? Well, in a, in a, we, our monetary system is a partial reserve system in that uh, it's based on paper money and the reserves or the cash that banks have to uh, operate uh, is multiplied by five, six, seven times so that uh, there's a sort of general leveraging in the monetary system. And when you have a system like that, you do need a lender of last resort. A lender of last resort means if a bank is in trouble, not because its balance sheet is weak, but because it has a cash problem, then you should lend money to it. You should lend money to it, you should even print money to lend it temporarily for, uh, as against good, good assets. And this is what Walter Badger, Badger said in 1872, I think, or 65, in, in the 19th century. So that's one, that's one role. And yes, if you have the monetary system we have, you do need central banks to stop uh, check, uh, checking accounts being destroyed because they are money. That's quite a different thing to help companies that are bankrupt. Indeed. And it's quite a different thing from bailing out the government from excess spending, which, Absolutely. which has got to be one of the fundamental reasons for quantitative easing. Yes. I mean, I just wonder what the interest rates would be in America and, and uh, in Britain if uh, the central banks didn't um, suddenly turn around and say, here's another 70 billion pounds we're going to create out of thin air. Yes, they have this idea that low interest rates and lots of money will give you growth. They may ease a situation immediately, but then people notice that it's really paper money, and I don't think that'll give you the growth that people want. Growth comes from other things comes from discovering new ways of doing things, from new resources, from people working harder and so on, or people being better trained, etc. But not from money being sloshed about and sent, uh, sent around. So indeed I, I think that mm, the, dollar, the dollar policy is one that's hurting the whole world and especially hurting us in Europe and we are following too. Um, 
it's that and the fact that the American government needs money for its deficit. There's one thing that we economists say, when you have a government deficit, then you have a deficit in the balance of payments. And then you have other people who are selling you things and taking your money in exchange. And that has also political consequences because the Chinese are taking green paper uh, with, with Franklin's head on it and perhaps IOUs from the American government and they now have a lot of power over the American government because if they started selling that they would hurt themselves but they would have hurt the Americans too. So the irresponsible way that the American government has been dealing with war and expenditure and war against terror and so on is, is undermining their power and undermining the power of the West. And I think it's very worrying that governments, and especially the American government, should misbehave in this way. It does feel rather like end of empire in a sense, doesn't it? Well, if they want but to end their empire, let them do so it. They have the resources to stay at the head of everything. Pedro, it's been fascinating talking to you. Um, we, I, I'd love to continue for another hour because <laughs> there is so much to talk about and what's going on. But anyway, I'm very grateful uh, for this opportunity to talk to you. And, um, uh, you know, let's hope that Spain and Europe don't quite disappear in the way <laughs> in which it, some people think it might. It seems they're going to listen to us because we have such a good network on the internet. Is exactly, right? exactly. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Thank you.